Welcome to this uh, interview with uh, Dudley Goff. My name is Catherine Westinger, and I'm a professor of the history of religions at Loyola University in New Orleans. And so, Dudley, welcome. I'm glad you're here with me today. I appreciate it. Good. You're sure welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Great. So I'm going to uh, introduce Dudley Goff, but while I introduce him, I'm uh, intermixed with all that. I'm going to um, mention briefly things in the history of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists and the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists of Waco, because um, Dudley Goff was very much involved with the, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists uh, as in his youth and as a young man. So uh, I'm going to be mentioning some historical information along with introducing um, Dudley Goff because that's going to be that historical information is going to be pertinent for the uh, discussion that we're going to have afterwards. So Dudley Goff was born in 1931 to Seventh day Adventist parents. His mother's family members had been Seventh-day Adventists dating back to before 1900. In 1944, Dudley Goss' parents accepted the Shepherd's Rod message being taught by a former Seventh-day Adventist church member named Victor Hotef. Victor Hotef had been teaching the Shepherd's Rod since 1929. In 1934, Victor Hotef was disfellowshipped by a Seventh-day Adventist church. In 1935, Hotef and some followers purchased property west of Waco, Texas, next to Lake Waco, and they named it Mount Carmel and built a community there. In 1943, Hotef's group was incorporated under a new name, the General Association of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. So we're today uh, in this interview with Dudley Goff, we'll be talking about the Davidians and uh, another group called the Branch Davidians um, evolved separately and later in, se in a later decade. In 1946, Dudley's parents moved the family to join the Davidians living at Mount Carmel. In 1947, Dudley was baptized along with other Mount Carmel young people in one of the small ponds on the Mount Carmel property. In 1948, he entered Cedar Lake Academy of Seventh-day Adventist boarding school, a high school, and graduated in 1950, having been elected pastor of the senior class. In early 1951, after one semester at Emmanuel Missionary College, Dudley moved back to Mount Carmel. For about a year, Dudley Goff traveled with a senior Davidian Bible teacher around the United States and Canada, giving Bible studies on the Shepherd's Rod message to Seventh-day Adventists in their homes. To prepare for his continuing Bible teaching ministry, Dudley Goff attended Mount Carmel's Davidic, Levitic, excuse me, Davidic Levitical Institute, in addition to taking selected classes in speech, debate, radio, and acting at Baylor University in Waco. In 1955, Victor Hotev died and his wife, Florence Hotev, became the leader of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. On December 7th, 1955, the General Association of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists sold the Mount Carmel property west of Waco next to the lake and purchased 941 acres located nine miles east of Waco. And the Davidian community relocated to the second property and it was known as New Mount Carmel. So the, the setting and the property location has changed at this point uh, to east of Waco. About that time in the mid 1970s, after several years of teaching the Rod message in Adventist homes, Dudley Goff was called back uh, to the Davidian community to preach the 11th hour call message carried over the ABC network of radio stations to the nation in prelude to events predicted to occur on April 22nd, 1959. After the predicted events failed to occur on April 22nd, 1959, Dudley Goff left, left New Mount Carmel and the Davidians. Uh, and then the history of the Davidians and then the Branch Davidians continued. So just briefly, 
After much of the new Mount Carmel, Carmel property was sold off, the remaining 77 acres would be purchased by Ben Roden in 1973 on behalf of his organization named the General Association of Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, which was founded in 1959. So that was the beginning of the Branch Davidians, the Branch Davidian lineage, and they had their own history. The smaller Mount Carmel property east of Waco would be the location of the conflict in 1993 between federal agents and the Branch Davidians, at that time led by David Koresh. However, Dudley Goff had relocated to Astoria, Oregon in 1961 after having started a career in secular radio after the failure of the prediction involving the Davidians in 1959. He was married and raised a family in Oregon. 20 years later, um, the couple were divorced. In 1980, Dudley Goff made his first trip to Israel, setting him on a track that has carried him to his God-given current assignment to bless the poor and the needy in Israel. In 2008, he produced a documentary entitled Messianic Jews, Why Should I Care? The documentary was filmed during two months of interviewing Jews living in Israel who, ha who have accepted Jesus, Yeshua, as Messiah. In 2010, Dudley Goff and his wife, Raven, to whom he has been married for 14 years, founded an organization named Israel Food Outreach. In 2017, Dudley Goff was awarded an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters by Promise Christian University in Covina, California. Dudley Goff will be 91 on July 2nd, 2022, and he plans to continue carrying out the assignment God has given him to bless Israel. So um, again, thank you very much, Dudley, for being here. And uh, I appreciate your being willing to um, make this recording about your very interesting history. Mm -hmm. um, could, could you please start out by telling us how you became involved in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and then subsequently uh, Victor Hotev's group known as the Davidian uh, Seventh-day Adventists? Well, as you stated, um, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist and my, on the mother's side, all the way back before the turn of the century, before 1900, they were Adventists. My dad didn't become an Adventist. He was a Methodist. He didn't become an Adventist until his um, 19 or 20, toward the end of World War I, in time for him actually to be drafted as other Adventists were into the army and but they as adventists they would go in as conscientious non-combatants not conscientious objectors like the jehovah's witness who would not go in at all so the adventists would go in as non-combatants and uh, serve in the medical aspect of the attempt to save lives wounded soldiers and all of this you know so that was his uh, that's where he came from uh, but my folks were very strict Adventists uh, from the very beginning. And um, um, it was in those early years that, um, um, that I recall as a, as a kid and coming on up. But my dad was always interested in um, the scripture and additional truth. We, as Adventists, believed in the prophetic of Ellen G. White, who was the founder, not the founder, but she was one of the early pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen G. White was their prophet, who had her first visions in as a 17-year-old back shortly after 1844, the great disappointment that the Millerite movement had then expecting Jesus to come that year, which he didn't do, but out of that movement, after it splintered different different uh, different directions, the Adventist Church was born, and um, the inspiration behind it was Ellen G. White, and all the way up to the uh, 1900s when my mother's folks joined them. But my dad believed that Ellen G. White was a prophet, as most Adventists, but he also believed that. Um, 
uh, truth was evolving, unfolding. God would speak to others. And in this case, uh, he learned about uh, the shepherd's rod, and Brother Hodup, who claimed to be a prophet, uh, but uh, no way was he going to get involved with that at all. On my mother's side, a lady by the name of Sister DeVille was a uh, elementary school teacher in the Adventist church uh, for uh, the, um, just a second here, I've got a conflict that came on the phone, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> But Sister Duvelli was a teacher of the elementary school up at Cedar Lake where my folks were, where my mother was raised. And my mother attended that school. It's later on in later life that Sister Duvelli becomes a, a Davidian Seventh-day Adventist or a believer in the shepherd's rod and the brother Hunter was a prophet. And so she kept urging my folks to get involved and accept the new truth, another prophet, in other words. And, uh, and they, uh, um, but my dad resisted it. He was not interested. And, uh, and so he, uh, uh, so it took some time for Sister Debelli to convince my folks uh, that they should, uh, that they at least should look into it. So the circumstance was that my, my mother, because she was in poor health in Michigan where we were raised, uh, she, uh, the doctors told her she needed to go to California where it's more healthful. And so in, in 44, we left Michigan uh, in my dad's 1931 Packard in a trailer headed for California and taking us through Dallas because it was sort of later in the year. Well, Sister Develli and my mother had kept communication going all the time. And Sister Develli saw this an opportunity to get my folks down to Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. So she tells them she wants to see see us as we go through it for California and um, wanted Pop to come down to Waco, only 100 miles further south of Dallas. And Pop said, no, you know, he wasn't interested. And so finally she said, hey, okay, I'll come up there, up to Dallas to meet you. So she... Uh, we uh, we were parked in a, in a camp there and Sister DeVille came up on the Greyhound bus and we got to visiting and she came with no money. <laughs> and she says to my dad, she says, I don't have any money to get back. You've got to take me back to Mount Carmel. <laughs> I mean, so talk about conniving, you know, I... Mm -hmm. I obviously years later felt that that was the direction of God, the way he utilized this and all. So she says, I'm, you got to take me back to Mount Carmel. And my dad says, all right, Develli, we'll take you back. So we unhooked the trailer and we drove down the hundred miles to Mount Carmel and we're there a week. My brother and I are in our mid teens. So it didn't mean anything to us except a bunch of kids there and all of Mount Carmel, and we just had a ball. Mm -hmm. But my dad started taking studies from Brother Hardiff then that week, and before the week was over, he was convinced that Brother Hardiff was indeed a prophet, and believing him really to be Elijah the prophet, at least the antitypical Elijah, not necessarily in person, that. Um, uh, Malachi says he's going to come before the the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he accepted the shepherd's rod message. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we went on from there to Southern California, and attended meetings in uh, the congregation of, of the Davidians or shepherd's rod believers, as they were referred to then, because they weren't mm -hmm. at that time Davidians. Attended those meetings and. Uh, it's then uh, two years later in 46, 
Brother Hardup invited our family to move to Mount Carmel. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, Brother Hardup didn't allow anyone to be at Mount Carmel unless it's for a specific purpose, a job or whatever it might be, you know, with the exception of a few older people like Sister Develli. And so it was a nursing home, you know, for older people this way. But other than that, you had to have a purpose. But my dad was a landscaper. And uh, because of the terrain at Mount Carmel, the, the ravines and everything, and we had 375 acres there, um, we believed, obviously, at that time that there was a ceiling going on in the Adventist church that would result in 144,000 being sealed uh, before the church would be um, would be purified. We can talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but Brother Hoda wanted to use my dad as a landscaper to build an outdoor on the ground uh, amphitheater that would house 144,000 or accommodate 144,000 wow. people. Uh -huh. And so that's the reason Brother Hoda called my dad and our family to come to Mount Carmel in 1946. Well, did he get that amphitheater built? That's That would be a big amphitheater. It would be, yeah. And we had the terrain for it, plenty of acreage, 375 acres and uh, the bulldozer and all of this. They, they started, but it wouldn't need structure. It was just going to be terraces of grass, you mm -hmm. know, that you sit on and, and then in a amphitheater type of shape. And, um, and, and so it didn't require uh, concrete or pillars or, you know, structures of this kind at all, uh, certainly not in the early stage. And uh, so um, I remember my dad working on it in Leavenly. You had, you, you had to watch washes because uh, rain coming so it could wash it out. So it had to be very level but tapered enough that there would be a reasonable flow of water and all. And uh, I had nothing to do with it, but he was in charge of that. Uh, and uh, only a few months, less than a year, I would say anyway, that they worked on it and it's sort of the idea faded away. I mean, nothing ever really was completed in, mm -hmm. in, in that regard, but at least that was a reason for getting us there, you know? And at that time then, uh, uh, initially, <laughs> my brother and I, one of the first jobs we had was driving the team of horses around through the the cedar brush there um, where they'd cut it down and piled up wood because they were clearing land too, you know, mm -hmm. and the wood would be burned in the homes, particularly elderly there in the stoves. So there's a picture of of the horses and the team there and gathering the wood to take to them. Uh, but then after, shortly after that, then uh, I was involved in, in the job of making the, the um, wooden things that go into the hives uh, for, for beehives. Mm -hmm. Brother Berliner from Switzerland, he was in charge of that. I remember I was paid 17 cents an hour <laughs> to do that. And then not too long after that, um, they assigned me to the, the cafeteria and I was put in charge of the bakery. And um, there's where uh, uh, my real training then in baking and so forth came from. Even uh, uh, they sent me down to Baylor University. I'd leave at four o'clock in the morning on my bicycle from Old Mount Cromwell <laughs> and ride down to Baylor University and uh, and went to work free of charge. They weren't paying me or anything, but it was to learn. And in one of the dormitories that housed 600 girls at Baylor University, and of course at boarding school, you know, working with these cooks, there was about six black men that were just terrific cooks there and I learned from them and all. And, um, and they felt I needed this and I did, you know. So that uh, that stood me in good. In fact, when I went to see the Lake Academy, 
um, I had the experience. So they put me in charge of the bakery there for the four years, or the two years that I was at, at Cedar Lake. <laughs> but that's sort of incidental beside the point, except it may relate to something else a little bit down the road. But in any case, uh, then in 48, then my folks were having a little bit of difficulty and all, and my mom left and her family all in Michigan and her family dead set against the shepherd's rod for the whole, the whole thing, you know, that we were in a, in a cult and error and all of this, you know, and uh, wanted to get me out of there. So they were able to talk the officials at Cedar Lake Academy, all Adventists, to take this shepherd's rod kid at high risk, obviously, but to take him out of there and to, um, to Cedar Lake to go to school. And so my junior, senior year, I took there. Uh, not that they- and, Excuse me, where was Cedar Lake uh, located? Cedar Lake Academy located at, um, near Cedar Lake, about 100 miles north of Battle Creek, okay. so toward in northern Michigan, um, where my mom and family raised. And my my uh, grandparents uh, lived there, mm -hmm. had the farm, and they were very influential teachers in the Sabbath school and all, and so uh, and against the shepherd's rod, so they were influential in in talking to the principal and everybody there at Cedar Lake that a, that, um, my cousin two years older than me had graduated from Cedar Lake Academy. And so they were really tied in real close. So they were gonna run the risk of bringing me up there from the shepherd's rod uh, on flavor, whatever you wanna call it there. And, and they were two great years. I really, really enjoyed it. It was just, it was just super and I then, Graduated in 1950. I had been elected pastor of the senior class, and um, and because of my experience then going to Manu Missionary College, I carried something with me in the, in the skill in cooking. So I was put in the cafeteria there, and I was teamed up with the head chef at a Manu Missionary College. And then there were two under chefs, but I was the only student. So I was teamed up with him and the Adventists are, uh, were very strict about the Sabbath, but obviously students there had to eat. So um, every other Sabbath, the chef and I rotated with the two assistant chefs to be in charge of the food for that Sabbath, you know, so that at least we had one off every time. Uh, but I remained there um, till the end of the year, the end of September, uh, sub semester and uh, at Christmas time, I decided, uh, no, I need to go back to Mount Carmel. And of course that would have been a disappointment to my wife's family, my mother's family and all. And so I went back to Mount Carmel. And Did your brother go back? My brother, uh, he had run away from home at 14. Uh, he got disenchanted with a number of things. Did your father stay at Mount Carmel? Your mother left, but he, did he yeah. stay? He stayed there. Uh, and then um, when I left um, during those two years, uh, he did leave because he ended up in Michigan and becoming the caretaker at um, uh, Commonwealth of Boys, what was the name of it? Was working up there as the caretaker. As, um, uh, so he had left Mount Carmel. So when, uh, but yet he was there when I in, he returned there because he was there in 40, in 1950, when uh, latter part of 50, early 51, yeah, latter part of 50, when I went back to Mount Carmel but left my things at a manu missionary college and uh i didn't go to be in mount, at mount carmel permanently but after being back there i decided no i'm leaving my missionary college i've got to go back and get my things and i borrowed my dad's pickup mm -hmm. from mount carmel to go up there i was afraid i'd be talked out of it so i took one of the students at mount carmel with me 
to go up there. Well, now I'm committed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they mm -hmm. did everything under the sun to try to keep me at the Missionary College. Uh, and uh, But I made up my mind and I was committed. I had my dad's pick up and I had this student from Mount Carmel with me. I had to go back. I had to so take him back. Hey, right, and take him back. And I got all my things to get, gather and everything and moved back to Mount Carmel. And it was then, then that uh, they teamed me up pretty soon with Brother Bingham, MJ Bingham, who was terrific scholar, terrific Bible teacher. Uh, he was a cripple, somewhat, a real tall man, about 6'4", or something like that, you know. And so he needed the help of a young person to go around giving the Bible studies. But I, I felt like that he was Paul and I was Titus mm -hmm. going out, you know. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him. And I really learned how to give Bible studies from him, you know, through that time. And so we traveled the United States and up into Canada, the amongst the Ukrainian people up there, a lot of them were Adventists and we were giving Bible studies in the Adventist homes and, and visiting Davidians that were around in different places too, in Canada and in places in the United States. Uh, all the Davidians or believers in the Shepherd's Rod were not at Mount Carmel. I mean, they were in the respective areas of the country of the world for that matter, you know. Uh, but anyway, so it was a great experience going with him uh, around and uh, and then uh, um, Well, actually, let me let, ask you a couple of questions here that yeah. what you mentioned is have raised for me. Um, so first of all, I just want for the viewer who doesn't know anything about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, for Seventh Day Adventists, uh, the Sabbath is Saturday, and that actually is the Sabbath. Uh, and in Judaism, it's the seventh day of the week. Yeah. And uh, so when when Dudley's referring to the Sabbath, he's talking about Saturday, okay? Because that's the day of worship in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and it's also the day in which no work should be done. Is my understanding? Right. Um, you mentioned you've mentioned two prophets so far. Um, uh, Ellen G. White and um, Victor Hodef, but you also mentioned them in relation to the Bible. And so uh, is their functioning as prophets, is that related to uh, being divinely inspired to interpret the Bibles? Yeah, absolutely. We believe mm -hmm. that Ellen G. White was, um, was a prophet of God and the vision she had and her explanations of Bible scriptures and prophecy and all were were accurate. I don't believe that now. Not that she wasn't a good a good woman. I have no doubt in that, and I have no doubt that God used her um, very very definitely. I think um, many souls will be in heaven as a result of her ministry and all of this. But that doesn't mean she was one hundred percent right. And mm -hmm. the same thing holds true with Brother Hodder. Now, there is no anatypical person in the Old Testament that would have been uh, Ellen White, in a sense, Ellen G. White. Uh, let, let me, let's stop right there. You've used the word antitypical twice now. So could you explain what that means? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Brother Hodup, though, fell in this category. She didn't, but Brother Hodup did, because we believe that Brother Hodup was the antitypical Elijah the prophet, prophesied to come in Malachi, um, Malachi 4, 6, I believe it is, uh, that God would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus took that and spoke of John the Baptist in his day as the antitypical Elijah of his day preceding his first coming. But again, quoting the scripture in Malachi, sending Elijah the prophet, but that was before his first coming. So let, let me let me just kind of get this clear. So yeah. you have a statement, uh, you have figures in the in the Bible like Elijah. Yeah. But but uh, according to this uh, way of interpreting the Bible, uh, which I think is called a typological in, manner of interpreting the Bible. Mm -hmm. Elijah is not just Elijah in the Bible, but Elijah is also 
a figure who is predicting another figure like him who will appear. Is, is that this, so? That's that's the antitype. Is that yes. did I state yes. that correctly? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Elijah didn't predict himself that down in the future it's in Malachi. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm I'm not sure. Uh, um, um, it's written in scripture, it's in the book of Malachi, but it's God saying through Malachi writing it that before the uh, great and dreadful day of the Lord to prepare people for his coming, he would send Elijah the prophet. Not, not, no, not no. Elijah resurrected necessarily, but an antitypical Elijah, someone representing him. And, and John the Baptist was that for Jesus' first coming we believe that Brother Hoda was that for his second coming. Okay. Now, in an, another uh, video that I watched, which is very good, uh, in which you're discussing um, matters with um, Dr. James Tabor and Philip Arnold, um, you mentioned that Brother Hoda never claimed to be Elijah, that the, um, it was the Davidians who decided that Brother Hoda was the anti-typical Elijah. So why did why did the Davidians come to that conclusion? Well, because of the Elijah message. Uh, see, Brother Hodov was a very, very humble man. He wasn't arrogant or flamboyant or anything like that. He didn't like his picture taken and all of this. Uh, um, very frank, but he didn't want to draw attention to himself. I think there is no doubt in his mind, or was no doubt in his mind, that he was the anatypical Elijah. But he never put it in print. He didn't tell people, no, I'm not that, because he knew we believed it, you know. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell them that, but he had the Elijah message. He refers to the Elijah message and so forth, you know. So, um, I think, in a sense, it's it's just um, a a uh, indication of modesty on his part. You know, Ellen G. White was also very modest. She wasn't flamboyant or uh, you know uh, anything like this. Um, uh, but there was no doubt in our minds, and I'm sure in Belahada's mind, that he was the antitypical Elijah to come preparing the way, particularly the first phase of it coming to the Adventist church, which is God's church, the last church, the only church, you've got to be a Seventh-day Adventist to be saved kind of thing. But in Revelation, referring to the Laodicean church, they're neither hot nor cold, they're lukewarm. So they're, they gag the Lord. He says, I'll spew you out of my mouth kind of mm. thing. You know, I wish you were either, either hot or cold because you're not. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. But that didn't mean that they were not God's church in our judgment. But an unclean church. Jesus says that I have sheep that are not of this fold. This fold is his church. Oh, the Adventist church. Mm -hmm. But out in these other folds, he says, I have sheep that are not of this fold, them also will I bring. Mm -hmm. So our thinking was he would bring them from the other churches eventually into the Adventist church. But we were so lukewarm, it was just not, you know, not a good place to bring them at this point. And the Bible is saying that God's going to purify his church. He says, judgment must first begin in the house of God. Where does it say that? Judgment must first begin in the house of God. Well, I've forgotten where it is in the right. New Testament, you know. I'll, I'll look, look it up. Verse, your line comes in, the purification of the Adventist mm -hmm. church, making it clean so that into a clean fold, these others could, could be brought in. Now, I've always wondered about the name Mount Carmel and why it's so important. So does the name Mount Carmel for both of the prophecy, prop, excuse me, for both of the properties, um, does that relate to Elijah somehow? Uh, I think so because of the conflict that uh, the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on ancient Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, maybe the fact that it was a mountain and mountainous area west of Waco overlooking Lake Waco that that might have attributed to some degree to calling it Mount Carmel, uh, but it seemed to work together. I'm, I don't know exactly why they came up, came up with that name, uh, but uh, it definitely was a conflict between good and evil, right and wrong, uh, and wrong, um, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of God and so mm -hmm. forth, you know. And so when, it moved, when we sold the old property there, and moved to New Mount Carmel that was flat and all that still and maintained the name. So um, I think that's more the reason. I, I can't give an explicit, you know, how they came to this, how Bill Hodder came to that in the early years. Um, and I'm not sure when the, when it first was uh, conceived because they moved there in 1935 to Old Mount Carmel. So it'd be sometime before that. But was it in 29 when the lot of first started? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think so. So that's a little vague. Okay. Um, what's the significance of the word Davidian in the name of the group, the General Association of Davidian Seventh day Adventists? Well, the kingdom of David is to be restored. Mm -hmm. um, uh, David was a key individual in the olden times in the, in the Old Testament. And uh, um, so um, I don't know specifically uh, why they chose <laughs> that, but it's, it seemed to be a logical thing. And certainly a setting up the Davidic kingdom um, would, would uh, uh, attest to that, would, would make sense, you know. Uh, at that time, our understanding of the kingdom was probably uh, kind of vague. Um, unfortunately, Adventists then and even now in other churches and all believed in replacement theology. And that's what I believed then. I didn't know the term. I didn't know what it meant. I'd never heard the term or anything. But what, what it was in effect that the belief that God had rejected the Jewish people, the Jewish nation of the Old Testament and replaced it with the church because the Jews killed Christ, God rejected them, and now it's the church. So that was the belief, not that Jews killed Christ, but that, that was the belief that was being taught, right? Well, yeah, and I mean, a lot of people do. They still, they, they blame the Jews for, for killing Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is unfair. Um, and the Romans actually did it, but really no one did because Jesus said, no one takes my life. I give my life. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to lay that on the Jewish people is, is really wrong. And to say that God rejected them because of it and now replaced with the church is, is, a, is a false teaching. And therefore, with that teaching, that all of the promises in the Old Testament to restore the land of Israel back to the Jews and bring God's, uh, the Jews from all over the world back to their own land and all of that, that was all spiritualized. That applies to the church. Mm -hmm. Replacement of the Jewish people. Oh, that doesn't mean Jews can't be saved. They'd be saved like anybody else, you know, say. But they're no different than anyone else. Well, that that was wrong teaching. And of course, I believed it at that time. Uh, so the kingdom set up, even though it was a little bit vague, somewhat there, um, how that would be and all. We believed that once the church was purified, and was left 144,000 sealed ones after the, the elimination by the slaughtering angels of Ezekiel 9 of the rest of the lukewarm that were not mm -hmm. sealed, that they would go to Israel and there would set up the kingdom. And All right, I was going to ask you about that. So, and we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about Ezekiel 9 shortly. But um, yeah, so you said your, that your dad was tasks with the idea of making a large area, a big amphitheater, a grassy amphitheater yeah. for the 144,000. 
and of course, 144,000 are mentioned in the book of Revelation mm -hmm. at the end of the New Testament. And, uh, but I think you just answered my question because I've, I've, I'm, the question is, uh, where, where is the Davidic kingdom going to be set up? Did, did the, did, was Brother Hotep teaching that the Davidic kingdom would be set up at Mount Carmel or over in Jerusalem and Israel? Really not too clear a, a teaching on that. Mm -hmm. we, um, we didn't think Mount Carmel, the 941 acres now on the east side, would become the kingdom. Uh, but we do need, need uh, some area, you know, with the numbers of people involved in all of that. Uh, but that the kingdom would be set up in Israel, in Jerusalem, not in part of a thousand would go there. But specifically how that would take place, didn't know. Obviously, the Jews, they're no different than anybody else. So obviously, uh, the area would have to make way for the 144,000 sealed Seventh-day Adventists, basically, uh, to go there. Um, so there's a little bit vague on how that materialized. And also, we did not believe in the millennial kingdom in Israel. We believed that we would be in heaven during the millennium. The thousand and, years in which Satan yeah. is in the uh, thrown into the pit of fire, I think right. it is. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, All right. Thrown into the pit there and uh, and so we, we believed that we'd be in heaven. Well, okay, to what extent is there the kingdom between the purification of the church and the second coming of Christ at the beginning of the millennium? when we'd all go to heaven for a thousand years and then come back in the new Jerusalem to uh, the, uh, to um, um, Israel there, to the Mount of Olives and so forth, you know. And, Did you uh, believe there would be a rapture? Is this kind of a rapture up into heaven? Oh, yeah, that would, uh, the second coming of Christ, yeah. But okay. um, it would be, we didn't call it a rapture necessarily, but Seventh-day Advent, Mm -hmm. Advent in 1844, the Millerite Advent movement, so believed in the second coming of Christ to gather the saints and take them to heaven. Well, uh, did you maybe call that translation? David Koresh used the word translation, you know, being lifted up into heaven. Did did you all, did the Davidians use, that, use term? that term? No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, um, rapture has. Uh, amongst most Christians, where it is used at all, is thought of in terms of pre-tribulation rapture of the good people out of here, leaving all hell to break loose on the rest, you know, including the Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the midterm rapture. There's a, a 70th week, a seven-year period that is referred to here in the tribulation for seven years, according to Daniel and into the revelation there, midterm rapture in the middle of it, they go. Then there is the post mm -hmm. after the tribulation. We didn't define it that way at all back then, but that's what Adventists have believed. And we believe that after we've gone through all this tribulation and everything, eventually Jesus comes. Mm -hmm. And we're taken to heaven for a thousand years. Satan is bound. He has nothing to do during that thousand years. We come back in the new Jerusalem, as in Revelation, the latter part of it. And Satan, for a hundred years, he can prepare the resurrection of all the wicked. And one last attempt to, to defeat God. And he goes up against the holy city and, and, of course, and is destroyed completely. And then we enter into eternity. He makes a new heaven and a new earth, and so forth and so on. You know. So where? So when the when the uh, Davidians were going to were believed to be um, taken into heaven during the uh, millennium or uh, the millennial kingdom uh, while uh, on earth, while uh, Satan is in the fiery pit. Does that include a resurrection of the dead? Will they go also? When yeah. does the resurrection yeah. happen? 144,000 Davidians. The Bible talks about a great multitude. Refers to 144,000 as the first fruits. 
you can't have first fruits unless there's a second. That mm -hmm. makes sense. See? So okay. 144,000 first fruits came, would come from the Adventist church. The second fruits would be the great multitude that John talks about in Revelation that comes from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Mm -hmm. And then they with the resurrected saints mm -hmm. at the same time, all together would then in the rapture, and, or, no, we didn't call it that then, but in the second coming, would then be taken to heaven for a thousand years. And then so, turn to the excuse earth. me. So the first fruits are the 144,000. Right. Were, uh, were they ever called the wave sheep? That's an important term for the Branch Davidians. Yeah. It, uh, wave sheep? Yeah. I, I don't think we identified them as the wave sheep. Um, I don't think so, Kathy. I'm not okay. on that. Yeah. That's okay. I was just curious. Um, yeah. So what you've been describing, um, is that what is referred to as the shepherd's rod message? Yes. The and why is, it, why is it called the shepherd's rod? Well, Micah 6 and 9 says, Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed up. Mm -hmm. Now, here again, you get into typology or illustration. Um, what's the word you used? Uh, 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 typograph. Uh, um, <laughs> the. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, typological, yeah. Typological interpretation. Mm -hmm. That rod, the shepherd's rod, it doesn't speak, you know. Um, so it has to be symbolic. Mm -hmm. And so the rod is symbolic because it says, hear ye the rod. One of the versions says, listen to the rod. In other words, take heed to the rod. Well, it's... It, it is a message is what it has to be, you know. And so the message of the shepherd's rod uh, was that that Brother Hodder brought uh, that, uh, that was very necessary before the church could be cleansed. They needed to know their condition and needed to know what God was going to do and prepare for it. So uh, that was the message that he... Uh, he gave he's, uh, Shepherd's Rod Volume 1, but this is Shepherd's Rod Volume 2 that I have here. Um, uh, that's their, uh, that was the name given to it. And later on, of course, they were called, and all the time, even after as we, we were uh, officially Davidian Sunday Adventists, it still was referred to the Shepherd's Rod. You know, I mean, those Shepherd's Rod people, yeah, da, 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 da. Uh, I mean, <laughs> okay. so now, uh, so Israel, the state of Israel was founded in 1948, right? And Hadeth died in 1955. So I imagine the founding of the state of Israel was very important to the Davidians. Is that correct? Uh, not, not terrifically. The only thing that it was in the sense that, uh, there's where the conflicts would be taking place. How God would use these conflicts to make way for the 144,000 to go there was mm -hmm. not real clear, but obviously if it's going to be, then our eyes run it somewhat. But we really didn't, didn't teach on that. We observed it, you know, things happening in Israel and they're becoming a state and then the, um, the wars, the others that that were taking place, and uh, but how God was going to bring it about in getting us there, um, now very little speculation on on that. Um, Brother Hodder didn't say anything about it particularly. We just knew that would be the headquarters, and the 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 word would go out from there to the world. Uh, to bring in the great multitude, there'd be a huge persecution in Revelation 13. Um, uh, the dragon would overcome the saints. It says that he, he overcomes the saints in Revelation 13. They're beheaded for their faith. Those that are beheaded are those who keep the commandments of God, the Sabbath, as well as the rest. 
and have the testimony of Jesus. Believe in, in, in Jesus. Well, most of the Jews don't believe in Jesus, you know, and so many other people, but those that take their stand um, would be beheaded for their faith. But a little later on the revelation, it says, blessed are those who die. Doesn't say blessed, 144,000 who never die, who mm -hmm. live, mm -hmm. you know, that are swept into the wilderness somewhere where God preserves them for three and a half years, time, times and a half a time from the dragon. He's so angry that he can't get to them, represented in my judgment by the woman of Revelation 12, that Satan goes after the remnant of her seed. Mm -hmm. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And in chapter 13, it says he overcomes the saints. And then he says there's a blessing on those who die. And part of it, because it, it says, blessed are those who die in the Lord for their, this is the reason, for their works do follow them. So their testimony in their death is their works that's a testimony to those yet still on the fence, not deciding for God or not during that thousand years, I don't mean that, during that period of time that the great multitude are coming to faith as a result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit spoken of in the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. He says he's gonna pour out his spirit upon all flesh. The old man to dream mm -hmm. dreams, the young man to see visions and so forth, you know. There's going yes. to be a tremendous influx of believers into the kingdom once the church is purified, see. And there, they're the great multitude. But um, so those who die during that have a great impact on those and the fact that they did die for their faith on those who are yet to make a decision. So their works to follow them. I'm, I'm being a little bit fuzzy, yeah. I think, but um, yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering. So if blessed are those who die, for their works will follow them. Did uh, did Brother Hatef um, emphasize martyrdom for the members of the community? No. Okay. No, that was not emphasized. Oh, and follow a little bit further on that thought, though, of those that blessed are those who die. This, this also relates to the fifth seal, mm -hmm. which is, uh, shows the, the souls of all who've been martyred for their faith from the beginning of time until now beneath the altar. And they're asking God, when are you going to avenge our death? our martyrdom mm -hmm. and God says be patient I'm using my verb he's on it but wait a little longer until your brethren who are yet to be killed mm -hmm. that's those that are killed in Revelation 13 those who keep the commandments of God and have the testament of Jesus those that that die for their faith them and they're waiting for them but Eventually, God avenges the blood of all of those who have been killed, you know, yeah. and really is in the, the, the last act, frankly, you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say I, I can follow along pretty well. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I can follow along what you're saying relatively well because of um, Branch Davidian theology that I learned from Dick Clive Doyle. So I'll, I'll acknowledge Clive for yeah teaching the Branch Davidian interpretations to me. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to ask you now in the, with the Branch Davidians, the King or with David Koresh, uh, the King James version of the Bible was the only Bible um, that they used. Mm -hmm. um, was that the case with the, with Brother Hodef and the Davidians? Yeah, that really was the Bible we used. The Bible that I, uh, gave my studies out of going around the country with the Adventist homes that I, I've given now to, um, to Phil Arnold, as well as some of the other things that I had there, you know, not knowing what we're going to do with them. But anyway, um, it was the King James versions that I bought from the Baylor University. 
Um, I think I paid $20 for it at that time, you know, but a super Bible, but King James Version. And uh, I don't think there was a teaching necessarily that that has to be the one that was just what was accepted, I think, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Uh, I do yeah, it was sort of sort of cultural and American culture. It was the, the big thing was the King James Bible. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm recognizing the, not everything's hundred percent accurate there. And uh, actually, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, come to find out, there's you know some things, but nothing significant that it hurts at all. You know. Mm -hmm. But when I left the Davidians. Uh, I wouldn't read my King James Version anymore. All my markings and everything there smacked of what we taught. We we predicted certain things would take place in 1959. They didn't. Then we are wrong. Didn't know why we were wrong. I mean, it's right there as far as we were concerned, you know, didn't know why we were wrong, but obviously we were wrong. So I gave up that Bible and didn't read anything for a while. And finally, I then got the Living Bible. The Living Bible is really a paraphrase. Mm -hmm. but I could read it and, and, and a lot of good out of it. I mean, it's a good Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, it only on occasion when I run into something I'm reading that all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, that's... <laughs> and then I, I reflect back to my old King James Version, you know. Uh, but um, in answer to your question, the King James Version, that's what we used, uh, but a, a big issue was not made of it, to my knowledge. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple of people that you knew back in the Davidian days and who subsequently became French Davidians, and that's Perry Jones and, uh, and Mary Bell who became Perry's wife. So uh, what do you remember about them? Okay, that's probably part of the shocker when the fire took place because I really had gone undercover in a sense, gone into the closet. I didn't want anyone to know that I'd ever been an Adventist, let alone a Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. So I was pretty well hidden until the fire and then I see what is happening there in 93. And, and then to learn that David Koresh and Perry Jones, who I'd known years before, came to the front door and, um, and the, uh, the uh, uh, federal officials uh, shot them and uh, Perry was shot in the stomach and uh, died a few hours later. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Just I'll clarify. So on February 28th, 1993, uh, there was an attempted dynamic entry by agents with the Bureau uh, of um, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. So we'll call them the ATF. And so as they came to the door, and as you mentioned, David Koresh came out the, to the front door, came outside the front door. The Branch Davidian witnesses say that David Koresh said, wait a minute, there's women and children in here, let's talk. But his father-in-law, Perry Jones, was standing right behind him. And then somehow the shooting started, the, um, you know, there are different versions about how, about who shot first, but at any rate, uh, shots were exchanged. And apparently that might've been when uh, David Koresh um, was wounded in the wrist, perhaps shutting the door or something, but he backed in and shut the door. But, uh, but Perry Jones standing behind him received a, a, a mortal shot. Uh, he didn't die right away, as you said. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and again, the Ranch Davidian survivor witnesses, Clive Doyle and others say that Perry received the gunshot to the abdomen. Yeah. And and that it was terribly traumatic because he was screaming in pain, yeah. and they they put him on a on one of the you know the bottom bunk of a bunk bed, um, and that's where he died. So, um, but Perry Jones was an important figure 
in the David Koresh Branch Davidian community, he he handled a lot of the business. He handled, it's my understanding, he bought the groceries and and just handled a lot of practical matters for the community. Uh, and he had um, in the, on that date, February 28, 1993, he had um, two of his daughters there, a son, and um, quite a few grandchildren. Okay, yeah. and and three of those. Uh, grandchildren were sent out those were david jones's children but the other um, grandchildren remained throughout the siege and died um, in the fire that culminated in um, the um, uh, fbi uh, gas and uh, tank assault on april 19 1993 and mary bell jones his wife was not present at mount carmel at that time so she is, he was babysitting part of uh, the, one of the grandkids or a couple of grandkids and was off of that there. And I'd known uh, Mary Bell uh, 1944 in Southern California. I'd known Perry. Mm -hmm. Perry Jones was a classmate of mine. He's two years older than me. And we attended the Davidic Levitical Institute together and all. So I knew Bar Perry and he and I were good friends. Um, he obviously stayed after the disappointment of 1959 and I didn't, and I really lost track of him after that. But that was a shocker to me. And then Mary Bell, his wife, we knew in 44, after my dad and I, um, and my dad and mom and our family, my brother and I uh, moved accepted the Shepherd's Rod message in 44, moved to Southern California. Well, we attended Shepherd's Rod meetings in Southern California. And one of them was Mary Bell's mother in Mary Bell. She'd either gone through a divorce or widowed, I'm not sure. And my folks would pick them up and take them to the meetings. So, and Mary Bell was a, a year one way or the other, a little, I think a year younger than me, about the age of my, my brother. And uh, so, we were just kids, you know. I remember sitting on the floor playing uh, balls and jacks with with Mary Bell, my brother and I, you know, while the adults are talking, you know, doing their thing, see. You know. But uh, they were the only two really that, from the past that I knew of the Davidians under David Koresh at all. Mm -hmm. um, by this time, Lois Roden is gone, Ben Roden is gone. I knew them very well. And, uh, and any others involved, you know. Most were scattered in 1959 when, when things didn't materialize. Uh, boy, I mean, it was in a sense like the shepherd was, was smitten mm -hmm. and the sheep were scattered. Mm -hmm. kind of thing see it took a period of time for that to happen and all of this but the splintered went different directions my dad went back to the Adventist church my mom went to, and brother went to the worldwide church of God Robert W. Armstrong mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to have anything to do with any of it I just I couldn't give up the bible I could reject sister white I could reject brother Hoddeth and all that we taught didn't know why we were wrong, but we were wrong. And it, but I couldn't go so far as to reject the Bible, mm -hmm. which was the basis for um, all of our teaching there. So um, I went then into secular radio and um, moved my family up to Oregon in 61, like you mentioned to begin with, and, uh, and started going to Sunday churches. and got very much involved in a lot of things, ego building. I sang in a 65 member choir for 10 years in the church near Portland. And um, I got into acting and a um, number of things like this, you know, that and radio that itself just feeds your ego, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, let me ask you about radio um, because uh, in the video, interview that you recorded with James Tabor and 
Philip Arnold, you mentioned how you built your first radio, I guess you were a teenager. I thought that was a delightful story. So please tell us, how did you build your first radio? And I guess you were very, very interested in radio, huh? Well, not in radio in that sense. Here I am, a kid at Mount Carmel, 16 years old, and we're living out of this trailer. This is in 46 or 47. And uh, crowded in this 26 foot trailer. And we were near a bluff and a neat sized tree not far from us. And I decided I'm going to move out of the trailer and build a tree house, which I did and built the tree house there and a bed up there and the whole thing, just real neat. Uh, but I wanted to listen to the radio. Two radio stations at that time in Waco, KWTX and WACO. So I got a little crystal set and I ran the wire, it's 125 foot copper wire through the trees and all this, so they pick up the signal and you adjust the crystal a little bit uh, here with the probe on it and and with earphones and you could hear both radio stations. Um, and so uh, that really had nothing to do with broadcasting or going into radio. It was just a kid just wanting to listen to uh, to radio there. And of course, uh, Brother Hada found out about it. And uh, I, because um, I've been there now several months, and he found about uh, me living in a treehouse, and he got word to me that he wanted to talk to me and to come up to his place, to his apartment there one evening. And so I, I go up there, and uh, they just finished supper, and Florence is cleaning up the kitchen. That's his wife cleaning up the kitchen and whatnot, and Brother Hodup is sitting at the kitchen table there and I sat down on the floor with my back against the wall and we're just talking just a, just a good because we had a relationship you know uh, finally he said Dudley says I uh, understand you're living in a tree house I said well, yeah he says you know he says we're not monkeys <laughs> so and a little bit of dialogue here, and I knew where it was headed. And finally, he said, you know, hey, you got to tear it down. You can't live there anymore and all. So I accepted it, but it was a, such a neat father and son relationship between a teenage kid and the prophet, in my mind. Because prior to that, during that time and all, I would sit in the sanctuary when he's up front giving the message. And his wife Florence is on the left side of the front seat there taking it down in shorthand so it would be then transcribed to go into the timely greetings that we'd send out every other week, you know. But me sitting there, 17 years old, and listening to the prophet. God is talking to the prophet. I mean, I mean how, how great can this be, you know? I mean, how many kids in the world would, would welcome this privilege of sitting there and actually hearing from the mouth of one of God's prophets? You read about them in the Old Testament and all of this, you know? Hey, I had this opportunity. 100% believe that, you know? And it was it was it was real impactful. And then to have this relationship with him personally, you know, in that sense. And then some other relationships developed with him because <laughs> um, needing money, poor people sending money to Mount Carmel for the work and whatnot. Brother Hodiff came up with the idea that maybe we should start making cereal. Now we had what was called Mount Carmel cereal. It was like a granola. Mm -hmm. And in 1944, when we first went there, we got to have some of the Mount Carmel cereal. And my dad took a whole batch of it with us to California. But it was just great stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like granola, basically, as we have now, similar. 
So when I get back to Mount Carmel in charge of the bakery, then I'm also um, learned how to make granola or make the Mount Carmel cereal. Well, Brother Hollip came up with the idea that maybe commercially we could make a Mount Carmel cereal and it become an industry and a source of income, say. But you've got to experiment with it and different items and, and, uh, and consistency and all of that. So I was assigned that job. So anytime I had a sample at all for Brother Hardeth, I could leave the bakery, which was just right next to the administration building there where Brother Hardeth's office was. And I could go see him anytime, interrupt him on anything for another step here at all. So, I mean, it was, a, it was a terrific relationship from that standpoint. Now, this- oh, So let me, let me make sure I understand. So he was, um, he was sampling the, uh, the cereal yeah. to make sure it was the right taste. Okay, good. Right, yeah. All, right. Well, all of this, you know, kind of working mm -hmm. as a team together, but I was doing the legwork, but it had to be in a different form to be commercial. So they wanted to make it, um, they wanted to press it through a, a sieve like steel with crosses in it that would that would come out in different shapes and the like, you know. It meant it had to be put under tremendous pressure to go through that. So Brother Wolf, Merritt Wolf, he was the mechanic there in charge of the mechanic and everything in the shop, in charge of the bulldozers. And we not too long before that had purchased a big bulldozer. I remember that bulldozer coming into Mount Cromwell down the King's Highway, this huge bulldozer, $5,000 they paid for it, which was big money then and all. Mm -hmm. But the huge cylinders that would lift the blade, you know. Well, Merritt Wolf decided to take from the smaller Caterpillar, um, bulldozer that we had and use that as a hydraulic thrust to push this cereal through these these things that he created the holes and whatnot there you know and it wasn't working so then he takes the big cylinder one of the big cylinders off the new one that's massive now it's going to work and so start applying the pressure and it still wasn't efficient enough, but all of a sudden the cylinder split mm -hmm. open. <laughs> so much pressure, you know. Well, that he had to tell Brother Hoff about that, and that got back to him. And there the experiment quit, you know. It just it was too costly to replace the cylinder, which they had to do for the bulldozer and all. So uh, but that was a rough a few uh, months, two or three, four months, I don't know how long with Brother Hodup in that relationship. But those are special times in my relationship with him. This is why I have no bad feelings about Mount Carmel, Brother mm -hmm. Hodup, the people there. They were human by every, like everybody else and they were all good people and all bad people, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, um, and the beliefs were different. Uh, obviously, um, then the run of the mail, uh, but uh, very much like David Koresh and the group there, I couldn't agree with their teachings, a lot of them uh, at, that, uh, at that time, and I'd rejected my own, you know, from years before. But because you didn't agree with what they were teaching was no justification for the ATF to come in there with guns blazing and firing on them, and then 53 years, of the, 53 50, days, 51 days 51 later. 51 days, yes. Uh, then uh, a fire that, burning them and killing all of them. I mean, yeah. no justification for that at all. And I was very incensed about that, uh, you know, but what can I do about it, you know? Yeah, and so, yeah, so the, um, again, just to recap briefly, so after the uh, ATF, our shootout with the ATF on February 28, 1993. The FBI came in on March 1st, took over, presided over the 51-day siege, and then on April 19th, 1993, carried out a tank and CS gas assault for six hours. 
that culminated in that fire. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing all that. So you said that you um, knew uh, Ben Roden, the founder of the Branch Davidians, and also his wife Lois Roden. Do you do you have yeah. any recollections you want to share about them? What they were like? Well, as far as I was concerned, they were good people. My first meeting of them was not at Mount Carmel, but was after Brother Bingham um, or the the office of Brother Hart had been teamed me up with Brother Bingham to go with them. Uh, one of our first directions was going east, going west toward California and making stops on the way. And we stopped in Odessa, Texas, mm -hmm. where Ben and Lois Roden lived. Um, he was a truck driver. In fact, he owned a couple trucks, big truck haulers there and all. And we stayed with the family there and gave uh, Bible studies and other people came and all of this. And of course, here I am, uh, a young kid, uh, what, 18, 19, 19 years old then, um, uh, with them. Um, I mean, they were fine as far as I know. And their relationship with Bella Audip and the Shepherd's Rod and all was, was good and solid. And, you know, so that's about the only contact I ever really had with them was uh, in that. Uh, I think they came to Mount Cromwell to visit on two or three occasions when I might have been there, you know. Uh, but really nothing more than that. 